Hi, I'm Paul Dervis, and welcome to the second episode of In the Belly of the Beast. Today's uh, uh, interviewee is uh, Anita Stewart, the artistic director of the Portland Stage Company. Welcome, Anita. Thank you for having me, Paul. Well, it's a pleasure. Um, I'd like to start with talking to you a little bit about where you, how you came into theater, because I know from your background that you originally went to school for architecture, I believe. Is that correct? That's true. Um, I, theater's always been in my life. Um, back when I was a small child, I did a version of The Little Red Riding Hood in the garage with the garage door going up and down. Um, and I was the director, of course, and telling everybody what to do. But it always seemed like something that was fun and not something that would really be part of my life. So when I went to college, um, I started thinking I wanted to be a history major and went, ran through all of the social history classes and was not interested in political or economic history. And so started looking around for something else that made sense and architecture, I love to draw. And so that really was uh, something that caught my fancy. And so I ended up majoring in architecture and falling in love with it, except for the fact that architects build buildings that are going to be there for 50 to 100 years if you're a really good architect. And that was a, a scary thought to me, that anything I would create could be that long lasting. So you transferred, basically transitioned from architecture into theater? Well, I was doing uh, architecture as my um, undergraduate major, and I was doing a lot of extracurricular theater. The school that I went to didn't have a theater major at the time, and so I spent all my time after classes were over in the theater making work um, and having a great time with a, a really wonderful group of, of individuals. What school was that, if you like me? I went, I went to Yale. Oh, and yeah. I happened to be there at a time when a lot of people who are now very um, instrumental within the industry um, were there as undergrads as well. So Michael Service, who's a, a Broadway star, right. and Lisa Peterson and Tina Landau, um, two really great directors. Um, um, it, it was really a, almost a renaissance time to be at that school. Um, and so I fell in love with that at the same time I was doing this, this careful study of architecture. And did you uh, go from Yale into New York? Was there an entree into New York for you? Yeah, I, I moved after college. I moved into the city um, and lived with a bunch of roommates, worked nights as a paralegal, um, 7 to 2 in the morning at Skadden Arps, which has been in the news lately um, for not such good things. Um, and then that fed my um, being able to, I, I, I knew I wanted to do theater. I didn't know exactly how. I'd done a lot of directing and choreography when I was in undergrad. Um, but I was interested in this idea of set design. And so I started going and working um, at various theaters, interning. I interned at Williamstown Theater Festival for two summers and got to be the first um, assistant to the designers. That was a new position. That. that Williamstown had created back when I was um, of an age. And so I got to assist um, people like John Conklin, which was wow. just an amazing experience for me. That's quite an opportunity for, for a young person going into theater. It was, and that, that really spurred me on. Everybody that I was talking to was saying that I should go back and get a graduate degree, and Yale was the place at that time, certainly as a designer, to do that work. And so after a couple of years, I applied and got in and um, spent the next three years um, getting a design degree, a theater design degree at Yale. And how did you use that when you got out of Yale? Well, I was, I was very lucky. Um, when I was there, I worked with a director named Andre Belgrader, who is a well-known director, and he and I got along really well. So um, I was able to do a production right after, um, right after school, um, 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 Rameau's nephew. Um, that he did at CSC in New York. And then we did a couple of shows at CSC. So I was working with people like Stanley Tucci, um, oh. you know, really great artists, um, and, and working with Andre. And then that sort of led to me getting more work with other directors um, of, of note, Doug Hughes, 
Um, so it, it, I, I suddenly had a career that was taking off, but it was a regional career. So you started working in regional reps, is that correct? I started working in regional theater. So it meant that I was going into a city for three to four weeks. Um, I was their resident while the show was going up. And once previews would happen, um, you'd be there through previews. And then um, opening night, you'd pack your bags and you were on to the next show. Um, and for a good long time, um, that was something that was um, a, a really great thing to do, but it hit a point where I found that I had this small group of people that I was working with consistently. And you would make this art, but it really wasn't, it was for you, and there was not really a connection to the people that were in the space. And that got um, sort of trying um, for me as an artist. Um, I really wanted a community that I could be making work for. That, that's understandable. I, I do think that when you when you do work basically out of a suitcase, that you can find yourself being a hired gun to an extent. Yeah, and, and you rely on um, the same old tricks and the same way of approaching something. And um, I'd been, um, as part of that freelance career, one of the places that I'd come to very often was Portland, Maine. Um, um, and Portland Stage Company back when Richard Hamburger was the artistic director is when I started um, coming here. And I fell in love with the city, as I think most people do when they come here. It was just an exceptional place. Um, and I remember the porthole when it was really a porthole and there <laughs> were the fishermen who would come in for lunch and their waiters and it was cement floors and it was, it was fish and it was really down and dirty and it was an incredibly real place and it made me fall in love with the town. And working here, I built a connection much more so to the audience members, a lot of them board members, who you spoke to. And people here really cared about the work in a way that I hadn't found in other communities around the country. Down in Dallas, um, people were worried about being seen. So you'd sit behind somebody who was wearing this huge hat, and it was clear that that's why they were at the theater, was so they could show off their huge hat, not because of what was on the stage. And Portland felt like a very different beast. Well, Portland is very different than that. That's, there's no question about that. The people who go to the Portland stage or any of the theater companies here, I believe, are going really for the theater than they are to be seen at a theater. Absolutely. I, I don't think that's really an a, a, um, aesthetic here. Uh, so when did you actually become a member of the Portland stage company, and what was your function? Well, um, I started, I worked as an artistic director. I became the artistic director with Chris Ackerland. We were co-artistic directors in 1996-97 um, was our first season together. And we sort of got that job. We were both designers and um, we knew that the former artistic director was leaving and Chris called me up and said, hey, we should apply. And I'm like, Chris, we're designers. Why would they hire us? They're looking for a director. And he said, no, no, no. You and I have talked about this a lot. And, and indeed we had because as a designer, and seeing how different artistic directors ran theaters and theaters of this scale, when it's a director who is artistic directing, at least half of the season is going to be in their hands. So you get one particular point of view. And what we had to offer was that as designers, we were going to be working with a, a wider range of directors. So at Portland Stage right now, there are six to seven different perspectives that are given in a year. And while I will do a fair amount of designing, I'm designing for a director. And so what I do changes based on who that director is, rather than it being sort of the central focus of it. So it, it gives Portland, which is a relatively small city, a wider range of just inventory of what, what shows can look like, what they can feel like, what different voices can be. And so that was part of what we um, sold the board on. And we were able to meet with the board because we were here doing a show. And so it, it was easy for them to say, sure, come on in and we'll interview you because we just happened to be here. Right. Um, so they didn't have to pay for the flight. <laughs> and, and or how we, <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, and somehow we sold them on it. And I think um, for a long time, um, um, he and I, and then just me, we were the only designers running a major regional theater in the country. Um, and so it's a very I, different model. I've, I've worked in theater for 40 years, and, and I do believe that you are the first person that I've ever known to be an artistic director from the design point of view. And what you're saying makes a lot of sense because you're right, an artistic director is going to put their stamp on not only the season, but each individual show. 
Uh, I, I know, for example, you know, Joe Papp would say to his directors, you can do what you want to do, but it better work. You know? So the pressure was a different kind of pressure. Um, and you're clearly looking at it almost from a third person's perspective, that you would be looking at it and thinking, what does this person have to offer, as opposed to having it to be what your feel is. Well, and that's, that's with, with plays, it is. The director really is the viewpoint of here's how we're going to approach it. But I also know this community, especially now, I've gotten to know it much better. So I'll say here are the, the pieces that I, here's why I selected this play. And here's what I think is important and what is the important message to get across. And how do you want to do this? And then it becomes a dialogue rather than somebody from on top just saying here's how to do it. I'm curious as to how you actually pick your seasons. Um, I know that other theater companies really, oh, they get a lot of feed from different people in the company. The artistic director basically has an idea, this is what it's going to be. How does it, how does it operate at Portland Stage? It's, it's, it's a collaborative effort. It's both my staff, I have an artistic advisory committee um, that I work with. Subscribers will often um, say what, what it is that they'd like to see. People write me all the time, artists um, and people that come to the Portland Stage say, here's a play that you really have to do. A few years ago, we did Heroes, um, and um, Lenny Nelson um, had seen it in London and immediately came back and said, you really need to do this play. Hmm. And from that, it, it became a seed, and it took a few years for it to get into the season, but it was something that I looked at and the artistic committee looked at and said, wow, this is, this is a really wonderful play. And it was something that really spoke to um, our community in a really nice way. So you basically will take a play that you're interested in. It may not fit next season, but mm -hmm. you keep it on the back burner? Absolutely. That's great. There's a lot going on, and there's, there are new plays. There are plays that um, we may be working to develop, say, with a Monica Wood or somebody. So those, th that's sort of one um, vein. And then there's this group of plays that I know are really excellent plays that I think would be um, really ideal for the Portland community and then we're always searching for new what is the piece that we don't know and I think the thing that I have the hardest time finding are real good comedies yeah that's that's the hardest yeah I, I agree with you it's it's they, they're not really produced very often that's except on Broadway and often they're really kind of lowbrow right um, so I could see that that is a, a challenge for you uh, if you were to, if, if I were to ask you right now, you know what your next season is, I'm sure. How far, in it, how far ahead do you have an idea of what you're doing? We start working, I'm starting to work two years out now in terms of just thinking about what is out there. There are some newer works um, that I'm trying to figure out how we might be able to do that. Um, we have a very uh, exciting commission idea that I can't talk about quite yet, but um, th there's, there's new work that we're trying to develop as well. Um, so it, it, it is really thinking out into the future, um, but we really nail it down. Um, a couple of weeks ago was really where we said, this is definitively what the season is gonna be. And we've just learned that we've gotten rights to everything, so now we are in a position to announce. And we have an illustrator who's furiously um, creating designs for everything. So in just a couple of weeks, we'll be able to present it out to the, to the community. Perfect timing. Is, uh, is getting the rights to a piece for a smaller regional theater difficult? You're competing against theaters with larger um, audience bases and probably, I would think, maybe larger budgets? Well, it's, it's a, it, yes, it, it's, it's a combination of things. What's great is that we are here in Maine, so we're a little bit further off the beaten path, but there are products that you just can't get the rights to. Right. And so it's, it's really figuring out what we can do and when we can do it, and um, hopefully you do get the rights to things. And are you, yeah, you do a balance between new works and uh, either works that um, are classics or have been uh, kind of refunctioned mm -hmm. as classics. What, do, you, do you have a, a, a kind of a thematic idea of how you're going to do that? I'm going to do three new works and four pieces that have been heard of, or how do you do that? It really, every year varies, and it's, it's trying to create a season that has um, sort of a theme to it. 
Um, next year's theme is really about boundaries and borders, and, and so each of the plays will deal with those sorts of issues as we're looking at it. Um, but, but then it's also making sure that there's a good mix of things that are really thought-provoking, things that will push the audience, things that are really funny, things that are just um, um, sweet and lovely and a good drama. So it's trying to create a mix and balance it out so that you start with a bang, you end with a bang, and you go all over the place in the middle. So you're basically, you're also balancing like the aesthetic of, of, the, of the average Portlander versus um, what you think will be uh, provocative and eye-opening. Is that, is that a, a tough think, balance? I, yeah, and I think it's, it, it needs to be a little of both. We have, we have it's, it's sort of two sides of an audience. One are our subscribers who have been with the Portland stage, many of them since the very first days, and they can tell you about every single production that's ever been done there. And a lot of those folks really cherish and want the hard-hitting um, dramas. Um, and yet, when you do an arsenic and old lace, you're going to bring in a far greater um, group of, of regular people who just are interested in seeing one show a year. So it's a balancing act for, with how do, you, how do you fill seats, how do you do work that is going to bring everybody into the right. theater, but also how do you keep those people that really are at the core and at the center of the theater happy with what's happening. So one of the things you're doing is you're uh, making sure that your long-term base is satisfied with the cho choices that you have. At the same time, you want to broaden your base. Absolutely. I think that's essential. And, and that's we have education programs. We um, reach 14,000 young people over the course of the year. And part of why we've developed those so strongly is that, to me, those are the audiences of the future. And I right. think part of what we've seen is an erosion of that um, as um, people that are now in their 20s and 30s didn't have as strong a base of um, arts education as used to happen. And so going to theater is not necessarily part of what they do. And trying to make sure that this is something that young people in Maine really have access to and see as part of their lives so that um, moving on after both of us are gone, um, that the theater remains something that is a part of what is important in our communities. I completely agree with you when, I, I don't know what year you went to, what years you went to Yale, but when I went to Tufts, you went to the liberal arts program and people got a really well-rounded right. education. Now people want to go into engineering or whatever and end up not getting that education at all. So they're not gonna be naturally theater people. I do think that one of the things at Portland Stage, and I've been here five years, and, uh, and when I first came here, one of the things that I found a little disappointing in Portland was that it was kind of a fractured theater community. Mm -hmm. I think that in the five years I've been here, Portland Stage has picked up the mantle. And I now look at Portland Stage, for example, last, I think it was January or, or December, you guys ran an open audition mm -hmm. that you invited all the theater companies to come to. And that was uh, very welcome for me and I'm sure from all the other artistic directors. And I just feel like that is, you know, the kind of thing that, that you folks can do and are now doing really well. I also like the fact that I've gone to each one of the um, interns shows, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and I guess the, the, and to allow those young people to basically run their own small theater company is amazing, you know, it's what's missing, I think. Um, and, and I applaud you for that. Uh, and lastly, uh, you've, uh, at least a, a department at Portland Stage has started putting together a, a clearinghouse of artists so that uh, people like me can look for actors through your clearinghouse. That is amazing, and it's, it's what Portland needs, and you're doing an amazingly good job at that. Well, thank you. Um, it's Main Theater Collective, and there's a whole website that you can go to, and you can access all this information. You can find out what all the theaters across the state are doing. And this sort of came out of um, a strategic plan that we put in place about three years ago now, where we talked about Portland Stage really being a theatrical hub and trying to find as many different ways to reach out and connect within our community as we could. 
So between education programs trying to bring um, um, a diverse audience into the theater, trying to reach out more um, effectively to other local community um, theaters and engage them and involve them. It was great to have 30, 30 different theater um, yeah. companies showed up for those auditions and hopefully those will grow and more and more people will come and audition and we'll be able to build something that's more like a stage source where you came from Boston and you right. know how um, that is such a useful um, organization to have. And you're also using your black box more and more for local theaters to come in and, and work in, which is beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful space. It's, I don't know what it's about, 100 seats or something like it's, that? It's 75, and right now Dramatic Rep is there, and they're doing some great work. And it is, it's, it's really wonderful to have that space hopping. The Fringe has been happening um, in June in our theater as part of um, the Fringe Festival. And it's, uh, it's great to have a wide variety of different people doing different types of work in there because it just brings our community into the theater in different ways. And I do think that your um, education program, which probably is within the theater community, not the most known part of you, mm -hmm. it may well be the, uh, the fertile ground of our future. Uh, I, I taught in Ottawa at Ottawa School of Speech and Drama, and I know how many of those students became theater goers. And I think that you have the same potential for that. You know, to, you're producing a lot of young people who may well appreciate theater in a way that they wouldn't have if it weren't for that program. Well, that is really the hope. Um, I, I think it is also worth mentioning to the greater theater community that. Part of what's hard about running a theater like Portland Stage is that we are a union theater, so we're, we run on the Lort contract, and that really um, hamstrungs me. I, I have to use theater professionals, which right. means I'm paying a living wage, um, and we do a three-week rehearsal period and have people here and working every day doing things, and that's harder for people that are local community folks to fit into because they have lives and work. Oh, that's, um, that's true. Even, so, the, even the equity actors here often have full-time jobs. Right. And I'm sure you're doing it in a three-week process. You're probably doing a lot of 10 and 12s and whatnot, which would be really hard for local actors to be able to actually get the time for. Right. So it's, it's, it's a real balancing act, and we try to use local people. About 35 to 45 percent of the actors that we use on our stage are local, but, but it's hard. And it also means that um, it's expensive. And so that's why a lot of times our plays will be smaller cast size as opposed to, I, I wish I could do an Our Town. I wish I could do something um, of that scale. Um, someday, maybe. We'll I saw a play called Singer at the Barbican 25 years ago, the best play I've ever seen. It's going to have 100 actors. Wow. <laughs> Only in London would you be able to get away with that. But I, I keep on looking and thinking, boy, it would be beautiful on your stage. It would be fantastic. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're looking for ways to keep broadening and keep changing and keep growing. Um, and uh, I would like to focus a little bit also on the, um, on the playwrights that you work with. Do you have relationships where you'll work with one playwright uh, multiple times? Is that something that you strive for? Um, it happens sort of naturally. Um, we do, we run the Clouder competition and the, the one, one just closed um, and we get nearly 200 um, plays submitted into that. They are read, They're, it's a blind submission so we don't know who's writing. And we're going to choose a winner um, that will be part of um, not next year's season, but the season mm. after that. Um, um, and so that's a great way. And Clowder is New England writers, so anybody can submit a play if you live in New England. Um, and it's a great way to get to know the artists and writers in our area. And certainly people like John Cariani, who's almost Maine, we produced the very first, um, the premiere production of that. And he's come back a number of times and through things like Little Festival of the Unexpected, which we run every May, it's a great way for us to build relationships with writers. So we're looking, we're, we're keeping building those relationships with old. We're always looking for the new relationships as well. So it's, it's a mix. Um, and right now, we're, we're, um, um, I just came from um, the first read of a new play by Eleanor Burgess called The Niceties, which will be on our main stage um, coming it's up. It's your next show. So that's it, our, our next show is a new play. So. It may well be the show that's actually playing when this airs. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's it's hard hitting. It's it's a hard biting. It's it's. Tell us a little something about that, actually. Um, it's it's a college professor, a female, and um, um, a older white woman, um, and a student of color comes into the office to talk about a history paper, and it's it's a little bit like. Um, today's version of Oleana. It's, huh. it's hard hitting and um, um, both of them are right and both of them are wrong and I think it gives us a lot of food for thought about where we're going as a country and what really matters in our lives. I'm dying to see that. <laughs> uh, I saw the original production of Oleana when it was going through Cambridge because yeah. David Memmott lived there and I went with my managing director who's a woman and we came out and we said, that was amazing. She's so wrong, I said, and she said, he's so, he's so wrong. wrong, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I said, that's perfect. <laughs> and, and I think that's, that is what we're really after is that um, there will be as many different opinions about who was right and when they were right. Um, right that's great. So. When does that open? Oh, you're putting me on the spot <laughs> here. Um, three weeks from now. Um, <laughs> Whatever uh, that is. Yeah. <laughs> That will be playing uh, in, in the month of April. That will be playing in the month of April, yes. Great. And your performances are, are uh, six days a week? Um, we, um, um, Tuesday through Sunday, um, and we have two shows on Saturday, and there's, um, in the third week, we have a Thursday matinee. I think I've been given a cue that this is over, and I have oh, one. Oh, and I have one more thing to talk to you yeah. about. Because one of the things that really interested me, and, uh, and I'm a father and a grandfather, and the first time I talked to you, you weren't available because you had to run from the theater to home to work with your 14-year-old daughter's homework. And I thought, you know, that is what people don't know. <laughs> you know, people think of the artistic director of the Portland Stage or any place as, you know, somebody that walks around in a beret. And, you know, you are a mother and you have a responsibility and you clearly are, are dealing with that. How hard is that balance? Um, it, it is hard. It's a 14 year old son. And I'm just oh, going to say sorry. that. No, I'm going to say that because if he sees oh, he'll this, be he'll, really be, mad. he'll be mad. My fault, mea um, culpa. <laughs> um, but but it's I am blessed with an incredible partner who really makes it possible. And running a theater of the scale of Portland Stage is a little like having a constant toddler. Um, and so it's been raising children with that. And I think it, what's good about it is that they learned that they aren't the only thing, but the theater also is not the only thing. And I think it, it moderates both. It keeps you centered. Way. It keeps me centered very That's much great. so. That's yeah, what excellent. really matters in your life at any given time. It's not necessarily whether the light is exactly perfect. It's um, what Well, I, I, I'm, I'm with you there. I know how difficult that can be, and I applaud you. Thank you so much. I, I've been speaking with Anita Stewart. Uh, I, it's a half hour show. I could talk to her for an hour and a half more, but um, that's, we only get a half an hour, so that's all I'm doing. Minute what? Minute 30. I have a minute 30 to go? Oh, I'm, I, I need a, like a light or something, uh, so, because I'm seeing your cues and I don't know what they mean. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> you're going to splice this, I hope. <laughs> um, anyway, so well, well, uh, and your and, and your partner is an actor as well. Is that my correct? My partner is an actor and a director. Uh, yep. And and now that my children are a little bit older, um, um, it's possible for him to get out a little bit more, and so that's happening, um, which is a great thing. Great. One last question. Yep. As when you design a show with a director that you hired. How difficult is that balance? Because you hired that director, you're the artistic director, yet you are the designer for that person's vision. It's a really interesting um, sort of a cyclical collaboration because I'm, I'm the boss but of them and they're the boss of me. And so it, it, it makes it much more of a dialogue than it does um, coming from one direction or another. And most of the time, as a designer, I'm taught to collaborate. And so I'm really going to try to work with you, Director Paul, um, and say, what is it that you want to do? Um, but always in the back of my head, what I've got is we're doing this for the people of Portland. And what are they seeing? Whenever I'm, I'm looking at a piece, I'm trying to look at it and sit there and say, if I were somebody walking into this theater knowing nothing about it, how am I going to, what am I going to understand? 
how am I going to engage with this piece? And that's really how I approach it. I'd love to work with you. <laughs> we'll do a taste of honey. I'll say to you, I want the walls to be decrepit. All right. I want to see the frames. <laughs> I want to see concrete. I want to see broken. And you're going to say, look, I'm going to give my own design here. It's going to fit what you want, and I'm going to say thank you. Oh, that's, that's lovely. Um, but it's, it's great to hear, and that, that is, for me, that's a big challenge, is always making it new, always making it fresh. Um, I'm not going to a million different theaters and getting to repeat over and over again. Do you, occasionally, do you miss that? Do you miss going to other theaters? Um, yeah, there are times, especially when I don't have to worry, when I can go and just design and not worry about, are people going to come? Is it going to be on budget? Is everybody going to be happy? Are actors going to be, you know, satisfied? Um, yeah. There's a. It's like a vacation for you. It Have you is. stopped? I think we've stopped. Okay. <laughs> Are you going to somehow be able to splice that together? I well, we've had Anita Stewart of the Portland Stage Company here with us tonight. She is our first real guest because the first episode was the producer and myself, and I have been so honored to have her. Um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing her work in the future. I've enjoyed her work in the past, and she is one fascinating young woman. Thank you very much, Anita. Thank you. Welcome to episode three of In the Belly of the Beast, the show that interviews artists in the greater Portland community as well as Southern Maine. Tonight we have with us Lynn Cullen, who is a storyteller, a playwright, a graphic artist, and also a global traveler. <laughs> Hi, Lynn. How are you tonight? Good. Nice to be here. Could you tell us a little bit about your background? I was fascinated by all the places you lived. You're originally from where? I'm originally from Waterbury, Connecticut. And um, then I uh, moved to Boston for a few years after I got out of college. What were you doing in Boston? Um, I was actually working uh, as a graphic designer and uh, at a print shop. Do you mind telling us where? It was called, uh, well, I actually, um, first I worked at the Harvard Coop. And, uh, <laughs> I worked at the Coop. Yeah, they had an advertising <laughs> department, believe it or not. And I worked at a place called Pandic Press, and I worked at Crimson Travel, um, and then a place called BBC Bookbinding. And what years were those that you were living in Boston? That was from 1978 to or late 77 to maybe 1983. That's when I was running my theater at Inman yeah. Square. Uh, uh, where did you go from, from Boston? Uh, I moved to uh, New Hampshire, and I was living in Alstead, New Hampshire, and I was working at an ad agency in Keene for the best part of 10 years. So, so far, you're basically just bouncing around New England. Yeah, but halfway during my 10 years in, in New Hampshire, I went to and lived in Australia for two years. Australia? Yeah. And, um, That's interesting. What were you doing there? I was kind of being a traveler and a general, you know, bum. And, <laughs> and I uh, worked for, I ended up working as a canvasser for a Greenpeace Australia. Uh, I didn't have a green card or anything, but they weren't too picky back then. And, um, I was going to ask you that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you were there for how long? I was there for two years. How did you like it there? Oh, I loved it. I would have stayed there if I could have figured out a way to do it. Oh. So. And then? Uh, then I actually went back to the exact same job and place in New Hampshire where I had been before, spent another six years there, and then moved to England. Where in England were you? I was uh, three years in England, half of the time in Tunbridge Wells in Kent. I worked in London for a bit, and then half the time up in Yorkshire. And I bet you it was in England that you started doing your storytelling. Is that right? Yes. I kind of know that. <laughs> Tell us about that. Um, my, my then husband, who was British, uh, he and I had moved to England, and he's a field biologist. And right after we found a place, he got a gig and had to go, had to, go to Chile for three months. So we moved into this apartment, and I was banging around looking for work. And I saw a sign up that said at this local pub, the wonderfully named uh, Broker's Arms, was having storytelling. And I thought, storytelling wow so I went and it was this little upstairs room and you have a pint of beer and there was some guy that had all these instruments like musical instruments and um, he told uh, folk tales and I thought this is fantastic it was adults it wasn't kitty stories and and then no they, rugrats on the floor no nothing of the kind it was purely a grown-up thing it's it's a really big deal in England and uh, and then they had a, what we call an open mic and they call stories from the floor 
and I thought, I really want to get up there. You know, this is fantastic. And I didn't have anything, so I, I just thought, well, I'll tell a, I told this kind of slightly off-color joke, because jokes are stories as well. So. Uh, to take a big risk here, <laughs> uh, would you share with us the, uh, the uh, first story, the off-color story? Yeah. Okay, and if you need to, like, you know, close your, you know, put your hands over your ears. I don't think it's that bad, though. No. Um, all right, so there were three couples who uh, wanted to convert to Catholicism. And they saw the priest, and he, you know, told each of the couples that, you know, they'd done all the, you know, the training and the studying. And he said, you're, you're almost there. He said, I just want one little test for all of you. I want you to go away for 30 days. Do not have relations with your spouse. And then you, you come back and we'll talk. So they all agreed, and 30 days went by, and, you know, um, the first couple came back, and he said, how did you get on, my children? And, you know, they said it was very, very hard, but we, we did it. You know, we were that dedicated, you know, and, and he said, bless you, my children. Uh, you, welcome to the Catholic Church. And so they went away, and the second couple came in, and he said, oh, welcome, my children. How did you do? And uh, they said, we lasted 28 days. And he said, oh, and, and the, you know, the husband said, we just, you know, we're so passionate about each other and we really did our very best and we, we just about made it, but oh, I couldn't bear to be parted from my wife or she from me. And he said, it's the effort that counts. Uh, you are welcome in the Catholic Church. And so then the third couple came in and he said, ah, welcome, sit down, how did you do? Three days. He said, three days? And, you know, the, the, the husband said, well, we, we really meant it, you know, to make it. Our intentions were good, but uh, I, I was just kept looking at my wife and she at me, and then one day I just saw her bending over the freezer and I just took her right then and there. And the priest said, I'm sorry, but you are not welcome in the Catholic Church. Yeah, said the guy, we're not welcome in Hannaford either. <laughs> But a bomb. <laughs> yeah, so that was that's what I told. And how did it go over? It actually went over pretty well because there were like a, three couples, younger couples, and the women throughout all the folk tales looked very you know enthusiastic, and you could tell the three young guys looked kind of a little bit like we're here for Mary and Betty and Susan and. And then when I told that, they totally were engaged. So they realized that it was not just, you know, fairies and elves and stuff. So I felt good that I had an effect. Including the guys into the night. Yes. That's great. <laughs> and you were hooked? Uh, totally hooked. I, I started uh, getting in touch with p other storytellers in England and, you know, going to, to festivals there. And, uh, you know, by the time I moved back to, to New England, I was really looking to do more with it. Now, the culture of storytelling in England is pretty uh, hard and fast, right? I mean, it's, it's ingrained in the, in, in the culture in England, right? Yeah, I think somebody once said, it might have been Neil Gaiman, like, America has geography and England has history, and so they have all this stuff to tap into, all their folk culture, historical culture from way, way back. And so their main focus when they did the storytelling telling revival in the 80s was uh, it's all about folk tales and myths and, and legends. Whereas in America, it's more, uh, it's a little broader. You know, the people do folk tales, but more and more, especially with the advent of things like the moth, it's more about, I'm generalizing, but personal stories and that type of thing. Do you find it, I, I know you run a, a storytelling series here in Portland. I'll let you talk about that in just yeah. a minute. Uh, but do you find that it is uh, more of an uphill struggle here than it, w than it was when you were working in England? Um, well, as when it comes to getting to hear uh, the st kind of stories that I prefer to hear, yes. Um, you know, I started when I moved here going to, there's a local storytelling group, uh, Moose, the main organization of storytelling enthusiasts. In fact, I'm going there after this. And... Um, it's they people there do a mix of you know some folk tales, but over the years it's more and more personal stories. And so I started my club because I wanted to model it after the English model with all folk tales and myths and legends. I mean, people make an argument, and it's a valid argument, that um, some rap music is basically the same idea 
but you know, as said as rap, and you could make also the argument that the slam poetry is really that too, although it tends not to be historic. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea of folk tales being passed along um, uh, fits into that mode. Uh, could you tell me uh, what the name of your group is and how often they meet? Oh, the one that I've created? Right. Uh, we're called the uh, Shanaki Knights. And we meet on the third Monday of every month at 7 o'clock uh, in the Yates room upstairs in Bolfini's, that beautiful round room. I'm going to pretend I don't know what that means. Can you tell me <laughs> what, can you tell me what, uh, the, can you define the title? Yes, um, uh, Shanaki is uh, the Gaelic, Irish Gaelic word for a, a bard or a storyteller. And so I wanted that in there because my main focus is Irish and Celtic. Uh, and then I wanted to evoke kind of Night after night of story, so I chose Shanaki Nights to evoke, uh, you know, a thousand one Arabian Nights, and so that's where that comes from. And it meets once a month. Once a month. And what day is that in the month? Monday nights at seven. A Monday, the third Monday. The third Monday of. How did I know that? I don't know. <laughs> third Monday at seven o'clock. Yeah. And that's at Bolfini's upstairs, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. In that beautiful little space upstairs. Yeah. And uh, when's what's the next? Uh, this will air. Undoubtedly, um, after the uh, March ep uh, episode, so could you tell me what the April ep uh, series will be? What yes, the April one, I actually, I feature a different storyteller every month. They get about 80 minutes to tell all kinds of stories, and we include music. I play music, as do my regulars. And, um, but for, I always leave a couple of months open for me to do something, and I happen to be working on, um, so I'm going to be the feature on April 16th, and I'm going to be telling stories from Kukulin. Uh, Kukulin is the great superhero of Ulster from back in the 8th century, even earlier. It probably goes back even earlier. You don't have a short piece that you could, you could share with the audience right now, do you, from that? Um, well, I could very quickly, I'll really abbreviate it, the whole idea of how Kukulin got his name. Uh, when he, was, he was so precocious, a warrior, that when he was seven, he already could beat anybody. And uh, his birth name was Sedanta. And uh, he was taken under the protection of King Conquivar of Ulster. And uh, King Conquivar saw him playing with the boys and was very impressed. And he was on his way to a big feast being given by Cullen the Smith. And so he told Kukulin, who was then called Sedan, to come with us. And he said, well, I'm, I'm still playing with my friends. Can I just meet you there? And he said, fine. So anyway, Conquivar gets to the, the hall of, of uh, Cullen. And before they sit down, Cullen says, do you have anyone else coming, you know, after your troop? And he clean forgot about having invited his foster son. And he said, no, no, why? And he said, well, I have a ferocious hound, and I only let him out after I know everybody is in, because he protects everything, and he's, he's just a terror, and he'll just rip anyone to pieces, and, um, and the pieces into pieces. And so, anyway, he said, yeah, go ahead, release him. So meanwhile, Sedanta uh, is, he's juggling his hurling stick and all this, and he, he finally gets there, he walks through the gate, and this dog is like, and comes at him, and uh, Sedanta doesn't miss a beat. He throws up his, his ball, and he whacks it so hard with his stick that it goes right through the dog's gullet and out the other end and kills the dog dead. Sorry, dog lovers, I have a dog too. But anyway, they all run out. Uh, King Conquivar is expecting to find his you know, nephew dead, and, and uh, he finds him alive, and he's overjoyed. But Colin the Smith is like, you, you killed my dog. This, is, this dog protected my livelihood. And, and uh, Sedanta, the, the boy, says, don't worry, I'll make it up to you. And they're like, how? And he said, I'll find you a pup just like him, and I'll raise him to be every bit as fierce and good a hound as, as your own. But until that time, I will be your hound and protect your, your property. And so uh, the king said, well, from then on, then your name will be Kukulin, which means the hound of Cullen, Cullen's hound. And he said... That sounds like a fine name, and he was Ku Cullen from then on until the day he died. And that's only four minutes of like an hour and a half to two hours of what you're going to do, right? Yeah, the, the one I'm going to do, uh, it's like a premiere where we're, I'm working on it. Um, that one will probably be an hour with music. Uh, my partner, Kirk Kish, is going to compose a score to go with it. So that's just a trailer for uh, yeah. for Monday, April 16th. 16th. And if I'm not... It, Correct me if I'm mistaken, 
although there's no cost to coming, there's a, dona a suggested donation, is that right? Yeah, we ask for a $9 uh, suggested donation. Or three beers. Or three beers, <laughs> yeah, for the teller. Great. <laughs> um, great. Now, we haven't even touched on the fact that you're a playwright as well. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little something about where that came from? Is that like a natural outgrowth of your storytelling? or? Yeah, I guess you would say it is. Um, I was in England and... Um, taking some writing you know, classes. I was in some writing groups, and one of them was even called Writing for Performance, where we'd get up and do you know, stories and monologues. And when I moved from England back to New England, and I chose Portland, Maine, the first thing I did was look for some writing groups of some kind, and all I found was, um, uh, they, well, it was Acorn was briefly called something else, but Acorn Productions was offering uh, Play, playwrights classes, and I thought, well, I'm not that interested in doing writing for theater, but it's writing. So I started going to them, and I, I never stopped, and I love playwriting. And tell me about which plays, how many plays have you written? Have you written full length, one act, ten minutes? What have you done? I, I guess I've written about six full length plays, and maybe about ten or twelve, uh, like one act set somewhere between thirty and forty five minutes, and a whole bunch of 10-minute plays. And do you, uh, do you bring the 10-minute plays to Crowbait? I, I sometimes do, yeah, and I, I submit them to various things as well. We'll be talking to uh, Michael Tour of Crowbait in the future. Crowbait is a monthly group that gets together. Uh, the theater community and writers bring in 10-minute pieces, and that's why I was asking Lynn about that. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me about productions that you've had from your plays? Uh, yes. Um, a uh, one-act play of mine called Waiting for Jack uh, was produced at Players Ring, which is a theater group in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, it was either two or three summers ago for their late night series. Mm -hmm. It got two weekends and a full production, and I uh, was really pleased uh, with the outcome of it. That's great. Yeah. And a different audience in Portland, too. Yes, so. it was all different people. Right. Yeah. Not necessarily people coming for you, they're coming for the play, yes. which is always a, a, a treat, I think, for a writer. It, well, I had one really great thing happen, because, you know, Late Night, as a friend of mine said, is a lonely place, the Late Night series. Uh, but I did pretty well, and I think part of it was the subject matter. It was inspired by um, a story my father told me about he and his brother waiting all night in the, in the rain in November, two days before the presidential election in 1960. Kennedy, uh, JFK, came to Waterbury. And so I made up a whole story about mm. that. And uh, there was a couple that came, you know, it was summer, and they were from Waterbury. And he, they were, you know, they visit Maine. And he was just, that's what drew them to the play. And he was so thrilled, and he asked for a poster, because I also designed the poster. And, uh, and I said, sure, I said, you know, I said, I didn't have a spare, I said, I'll mail it to you. And uh, he said, well, what should, what'll I owe you? And I said, just uh, become a member of uh, Players Ring and we'll call it even. So uh, he's got it hanging in his office. I'm going to be having <laughs> you do all the graphic artwork for my theater now. Sure. <laughs> you know, because I'll let you be a member. <laughs> um, could you tell me about, you, you, you segued beautifully into your graphic artwork. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me what you actually enjoy doing and and what you think your uh, interest is in that? Well, I've been working as a, a graphic designer for many, many years. And uh, when I moved to Portland, I was a freelance graphic designer um, working for several different agencies in Portland for about eight years. And uh, then I got a full-time job, but now I'm done with that. So um, I, I love doing, well, I do every month for Shanaki Nights, I do a, a gorgeous poster. So that's one if you of the, do say so yourself. If I do say so. <laughs> the, the storytellers, it's one of the reasons they'll come all the way up from Boston and so on to come and perform, because not only do they get, like, it's just a door split, but they get a, a poster. really fantastic poster featuring them. So uh, I love doing that, and I, I like doing anything that goes to print. You know, I do a lot of big infographics and brochures. And Are you worried that that's a dying art? Uh, you know, it, it might be, but it's not there yet. And, and additionally, I've done a lot of um, banners and icons and infographics for websites as well, although I'm not aware. I mean, between the fact that paper into itself is disappearing yeah. and you can generically make artistic things on websites in the Internet, yeah, um, which personally, obviously, it's, it has no soul to it. But not necessarily do people going to care about that. So I would be worried about the same way I'm worried about newspapers. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's true. It's it's 
moving off. But like I said, I am often required or asked to do um, icons and things like that for websites people are working on as well. So. Now, can you talk to me a little bit about why Portland? That's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, I've always lived, except when I didn't live in the country, I always lived in New England. And uh, so I'd already lived in, of course, Connecticut and Boston and New Hampshire. And when I was coming back from England, I didn't want to do New Hampshire again. I wanted to do something different. And I asked around, and uh, I remember my niece saying, you know, this place is nice, that place is nice, but Portland, now you're talking. And the idea that was right on the water. Uh, so I just, um, I just decided to do that. And so what I year did you move here? 2002. Oh. Yeah. It's sort of after the Portland Renaissance had started. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'd been coming up here since I was young, and there was a period of time when Conquer Street, which is what we're on now, yeah. was pawn shops. Right. You know, sure. and everybody went to the mall. Yeah. You know, uh, but it's really, I mean, the uh, the uh, rejuvenation of the downtown core is spectacular. I think. Yes. Yeah, it is very much so. So, do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself being in the in the, in the next? you know, 10 years. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't mean Portland, but I mean artistically. Oh, artistically, yeah. I mean, um, well, uh, I would like to uh, disseminate, you know, the, the, the beauty and the, my passion for um, traditional folk tales. They're universal. I mean, I've seen every kind of permutation of them. You could, within that structure, which is so solid because it's been honed by thousands of years of telling, you could do anything and you could say anything, you could do any message and yet, you know, it's also this story almost puts people in a dream state and I would just love to convey to people, it's, 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 it's related in a way to theater but it's also very different. It seems to me the biggest difference is as a storyteller, because you create at least your own version of the story, right? Yeah. And although you work with musicians, basically you're the teller. Yes. And when you're the playwright, you have entered into a collaborative art form. Yes. And as much as, and you know this from other people in your playwriting yeah. group, you can't hold control. It doesn't work that way. Correct. You write a play, a director has a vision for the play, actors have a vision for their character within that play, and it may not be what you want. Do you have, a, a, how do you feel about that balance? I, um, it took in the very beginning just a tiny bit of getting used to, because I had not experienced it before, you know, being used to the composing and telling and, um, but I love it. I really love it. I love that you, you hand it over and then it, it becomes, you know, more than the, you know, the, the sum becomes. It's new. not yours anymore yeah. and that's liberating. Yeah, it is. I, I really like it. I've always said my mind with theater is it's like effervescence in your hands. Yeah. You open up your hands and bubbles go in the air. And those bubbles are tonight's bubbles and tomorrow's bubbles will be different. Yeah. And every, every production and every performance will be new unto itself and not yours anymore. Yeah. And right. I love that myself. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and of course there's a certain amount of... Uh, I mean, you can write it in such a way that you can keep it as close to what you might want as possible. And then anyone, anything beyond that that the director would like to do, that's, it's fine. I'm, I'm happy to see it interpreted. Can I talk a little bit about your personal life? Is that okay? Sure. Um, do you, are you doing like a nine to five or anything like that? No, not right now. Okay, and you're okay with that because I know that can be a real struggle for artists, especially I think storytellers. It is. Well, I'm in early stages of that. Yeah. Uh, I've only been, uh, you know, not working full time since the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on several different things. Um, I just applied for a a grant to to uh, further develop Kukulin. It's going to be longer and more music, and I'm I'm hoping I'm going to do a a weekend performance in the fall at uh, Mail Street Performing Arts. Is that like a main council of the arts grant or? Yeah, it's a, a main arts commission. And are you specifically going for a grant for storytelling or just artistic uh, writing or what? It's for a, it's going to be a multimedia performance because okay. it will have the the telling and it will have the, the musical score and uh, as a visual. So you artist, put together a you put together a uh, a, 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 a concept for an actual production that yes. you would and that's yeah. what you'll be getting the grant or not getting it on. Yeah. And how does that look as far as right Maine right now? It doesn't seem like Maine is 
loaded with giving artists money. Um, well, the Maine Arts Commission has, a, you know, a certain amount of money for uh, individual artists, so it's not just organizations, right. you know, and and so uh, it, it, the chances aren't terrible. You Good. Know, they're not bad. <laughs> Great. Um, and what about family? Do you have family here? Um, my family are, well, I'm, my sisters live in Cape Cod in Vermont. Uh, my partner, Kurt, and I live in, um, in Portland. And, uh, you know, most of the rest of my family are, you know, I have a lot of cousins that are still in Waterbury. Well. So you get down there? Oh, Not you had an interesting story about Waterbury you told me earlier. Oh, well, um, about Holy Land. Yes, Holy yeah. Land. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? I'm, it is your next project, right? Yeah, I'm conceiving, a, I'm, I really want to write a full-length play set with a setting based on Holy Land USA. Uh, for those who don't know about... Anyone Which is everybody. Everybody, yeah, <laughs> everybody. Anyone who's ever driven through Waterbury on 84, maybe they're on the way to New York or Danbury or whatever, will see that big, giant, lit-up cross. Well, that is at the top of Pine Hill, and that's where Holy Land is. And that was created in 1958 by this lawyer and wealthy man. He was an Italian-American. Um, I think his name was John Baptist Greco. And it was his vision. And so uh, they created a little replica up on the top of this hill of the Holy Land. And they used to call it Bethlehem Village as well, made of chicken wire and <laughs> plaster and even like... Cray paper? Yeah, and old, old appliances that they, and it was awesome. We used to go there. Uh, my father would take us there every Good Friday, and we'd go around. And, I take it you're Catholic, over Catholic. Yeah, I was raised Catholic. And, and they'd, there used to be apparently 40,000 people a year uh, used to go there. But it's, and how many go now? None. It's been closed since the 80s, and it's slowly and more and more rapidly decaying. And the only people who went up there for years were you know, like gangs and drug addicts, so it's not so the a lot of graffiti now, now on the, on, on the little Jesus or something. Yeah, and and your play is going to somehow deal with that. What what is the yeah? I'm not concept? sure what I'm going to focus on yet, except that when Greco died, um, he in his will he left it to this order, secretive order of nuns. It's some order in New Jersey, and um, I'm told that the nuns there's still some nuns there in a little convent near there and they're in very, Waterbury in Waterbury yeah they're called the the uh, order of the the sisters of uh, Philippi and there's not much known about them except they're based in New Jersey and I thought I'd like to know more about those nuns the ones who were living there so is Holy Land like their little like uh, summer vacation getaway no <laughs> I, I they live there year-round whoever's oh. there is the caretakers yeah. Oh. yeah it would be interesting to visit yeah, it would be. I don't know if you can now. But. Is that your idea in the plays? You're going to deal with those nuns? Is that what you're, you're thinking of doing? It's one thought. Because yeah. it's an interesting thought. Yeah, You know, pr is. provocative, maybe offending a couple of people, but... Uh, well, yeah, maybe. But who knows, right? Yeah. And, and who knows. who's going to be afraid of that? Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, anyway, tonight, tonight we've been talking to Lynn Cullen. Lynn Cullen is uh, a storyteller, a playwright, a graphic artist, and all around bon vivant... <laughs> in our town of Portland. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you. I'm looking forward to your next project. I'm actually looking forward to going to see you at Bullfinis, where actually I've been. You know, I like Bullfinis. I haven't been to the storytelling, but I've been to their poetry nights. Oh, up in their room? Yep. Yeah, yeah I really like that room. It's a great little room. It is. I don't drink, so uh, they don't love me there, but... <laughs> but uh, I Anybody love... is welcome. I know, <laughs> I know, and I will be there, and so should you. Uh, that is it for episode three. I'm having a gas doing that. I hope somebody out there is watching. Thank you very much, and thank you, Lynn Cohen. Thank you. The Belly of the Beast is going to be a show about local artists, Portland, greater Portland, southern Maine, and people who might come in to do work. Uh, this first episode, our guest is not really a guest at all. He's my boss. He is the director of the cable station here, which is now called... The Portland Media Center. The Portland Media Center, because I have not memorized that yet. Uh, it's, it's Tom Handel. Tom is a, an actor. He is a director. He uh, runs uh, this cable network, as well as other parts of this, of the Media Center. And, uh, and he's an all-around uh, fascinating artist. I've worked with Tom. He's done three roles for me in my plays. I'm a playwright. Uh, and I'm Paul Dervis. I don't know if I said that. 
Um, it, it, Tom has played everything from a curmudgingly old surfer boy to a, uh, a, a beat cop uh, to um, the head of a department at a university. And he's done them all with equal skills. Uh, Tom, could you say a little something about yourself that I haven't yet? Well, I think you pretty much covered it because uh, otherwise I'm an empty shell. But um, uh, no, that is I, hardly true. I, I, uh, I, I am uh, executive director here at the Portland Media Center, where we uh, train anybody to uh, volunteer, as we have volunteers behind the cameras right now, who are, you're the real stars. Uh, <laughs> but we do, we really uh, have a lot of local programming because people come forward and produce shows and then they volunteer for other people's shows. And uh, we get to find out what's go going on in the community because of all these people interested in coming in. So there's a plug right now for uh, people to come into the station, learn how to use their equipment, do your own TV show, like uh, just as Paul's doing right now. I like to think that I am the anybody he's talking about. <laughs> so, but, but to know a little bit more about the anybody I'm talking about, Paul. What is, what is your background? You've got an extensive, long career in theater. Well, I've been kicking around theater since 1977. Uh, I graduated from Tufts University with an English drama double major and a minor in French literature, which means that I'm not capable of doing anything at all. Uh, but I have, in fact, spent my life being the artistic director of five different theater companies. It seems like I can't give a job, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, I've run theaters in, uh, I've run two theaters in Boston. I've run a theater in New York. I've run a theater in Montreal. I've run a theater in Ottawa, actually six theaters, because I run a theater right now in Kennebunk, Maine. It's called Storm Warnings Repertory Theater, and you'll hear more about it in future episodes. And that's where I met you, actually. Did that's a play right. Well, on... actually, you auditioned for us about a year before I cast you, and I kept on saying, I want to work with this guy. And that's true. You know, I loved your audition, and when I had a role that was right for you, I grabbed you. Um, and I've seen Tom do many shows that I did not direct, and he's equally good even without me. And the play that I was in was one that you wrote, so you have an extensive career as a playwright. I'm That's... a playwright, uh, a director, I'm also a uh, film critic. At some point I might actually do c tiny little film reviews in this as well, since I can. Um, it's your show? Because it's my show. Um, and because I go to a lot of movies, right? For, I, I work for a magazine called The Arts Fuse. Um, and I used to be a theater critic, but, uh, and my editor wanted me to do that, but I, I cannot do that in a town that I'm directing in because I'll be reviewing people that I would be working with. So what are some of the highlights of the plays that you've written? Well, uh, I wrote a lot of, I wrote several plays at, at university, at college. Um, uh, one of them called The Subway Hawker played on the radio. It was a radio play, uh, and that was in the 70s. That was like 76. Uh, but then when I started my own theater, and I got a little funding for it, because I had a show that was, I, I did A Day in the Death of Joe Egg by Peter Nichols, and it was, um, uh, it was incredibly fortuitous in that it was the Boston Globe, the Boston Herald, and the Boston uh, Phoenix's best play of the year. Wow. And Don Shuey of, I think, the Phoenix at the time, called it the perfect three-hour egg and listed it as top ten plays of the decade. What was it about? Uh, it's a very dark play. It's a dark comedy. Uh, it's my favorite English-speaking play of the 20th century, actually. <laughs> it's about a, uh, a couple that has a child that is uh, virtually brain dead and has been since uh, she was a baby. And it's a huge strain on the relationship. The mother imagines the child will wake up someday and be normal. And the father, who loves the child, is, sees that it's this continuous uh, blank space is ruining his wife's life. So he takes the child outside in the middle of the night um, and sits in the car with the child holding her with the idea that the child will freeze to death. And the child does not. Uh, and what I find so fascinating about that play is Peter Nichols had a child like this that died at the same age that Joe Egg was in the play. Oh. So to me, the play is really about the fact that his child will never die to him. And I also, as a vision of the play, when I was directing, and I'm literally 23 years old, I imagined the play, I imagined a black canvas, a canvas painted black, with a very powerful light behind that black canvas, and somebody taking a pin and putting a pinhole into the black canvas. And the light that comes through that pinhole is stronger than that light ever could be without that canvas. And to me, that's what the play's about.
Um, yeah. I love the place. Uh, Peter Nichols dated the Joe Egg. Um, and uh, that and David Mamet's Edmund are my two favorite 20th century plays. When, when, you, when you write a play or you direct a play like that, what is it that, that you look for in a play? What drives you to really have a, a passion for telling that story? Well, I can't tell you the answer to that because I, that was my, that was my uh, thesis at Tufts doing that play, and I ended up doing it professionally right afterwards. And the only reason I was able to do that play was because I was a theater critic at the time. Mm -hmm. And Nucleo Cletico, a theater in the North End in Boston, was uh, soliciting me because I was a critic. And they thought, oh, I'll let him do whatever he wants. So I'm 22 years old, and they said, you can do whatever you want. So I said, oh, I can do whatever I want. I'll do the play that was my seed thesis. And at first, I tried to direct the play uh, the way I had done it in college. And you, were, what, you, you took direction in college, right? Is that correct? I, you were I, taking directing? I took acting classes in college. I don't know if I took Because I, I've often found, and I teach at a, universe, a college up in Canada, and I teach playwriting up there, actually. But the one thing I'll tell them is what I learned, which is how you learn how to direct a show or even put a show together in college is not how you do it professionally. Oh. You know, because you, you, know, you have this big book and you're looking at the book all the time and you're making choices that are not with the actors. You're telling the actor how to move. And it's like, you tell an actor how to move, you take away their ability to, to, mm -hmm. to create the character. Right. You know, I may say to you, I want you to be in Steven's face. But I don't place you in Steven's face. I want you to find that where that is. Because you're creating the character, I'm not. Well, I've, I've had directors tell me, you know, this is what I'm getting at when I tell you this or that, but you know, those are parameters so that you're more spontaneous. You're in right. the moment. You re react as it's happening, not because of certain right. parameters. Right. Not because before. you're being told what to do. Right. And to me, that was the first thing I learned. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, but why I did that play, why it struck me, I mean, one of the other plays, I was my my field at Tufts. Uh, in theater was contemporary British drama from 1957 to 1973, very specific, you know, from look back in anger to what was going on when I was a student. And the other play of my, the other play that I loved, and it's one that I've never directed and I want to, is uh, a play by David Rudkin. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of the name of it now, it just went out of my head. Uh, it's about a couple that's trying to have a baby and they can't, and they go through all of the stages of trying to have a child with the doctors, and it's again, a dark comedy. But Joe Egg, believe it or not, is a comedy. It's a dark comedy, it's painful, but it's also filled with like laughs that you, that you don't wanna do, but he makes you do it. Um, and I always thought that the challenge in theater, I mean, I was very fortunate to have been raised in this kind of milieu because what I learned in it is that uh, you don't do plays that are cancers bad. And what I mean by that is if everybody agrees to the point of view of the play, you haven't learned anything. Mm -hmm. Much more interesting to see the point of view of somebody you disagree with than somebody you agree with. And if, if, the, if the multitude of people that go to theater all have basically the same landscape, then break it. You know what I mean? Break that landscape. Challenge them. Challenge them, exactly. That's what theater should be. You know, that's where it's separate, that's, that's where it's different than television. So that's when you, you said you were knocking around theater since the 70s, sort yeah. of. Is it, when did you get the bug actually in your life? Was it that time or was it as a child? Or what was I don't it know about the bug. It's a very funny thing you ask that because I mean, I was an English major first because I was a published poet. And I read with Ellen Ginsberg and Lawrence Ferlinghetti with a group called Stone Soup Poetry in Boston, which was quite famous. Jack Powers ran that, and he's like one of my major mentors. And I went to Tufts because Denise Levertoff taught there. Um, uh, and actually, uh, and I was like, you have, to, you have to get into her class. You have to give your material, and she's got to accept you. Okay. And she accepted me, and that's one of the things that I loved about going to Tufts. Um, but while I was there, I mean, I, I also took uh, Pulp Fiction from David Slavitt, who was published under the name of Henry Sutton. He wrote The Exhibitionist and The Voyeur and all these cheap novels. But he's also a famous poet, as David Slavitt. And Jonathan Strong, who won the O. Henry Award for Tyke, I studied with him. And then my, probably my major, the reason I'm in theater probably, 
uh, is twofold. One is that Juan Alonso, who was teaching creative writing and uh, was the editor of the Boston Review, uh, said to me, uh, if you really want your pe people to hear your words, write plays. And, and what he said to me was, plenty of bad plays get produced, plenty of them. Somebody's gonna do your play if you write it and it's any good at all. You write a novel, one in a thousand that you'll get it published. If you get it published, one in 20 will actually not be remaindered within two months. You know, you'll be able to buy your novel at the Strand in New York without a cover, you know, in a month. And I listened to him and I said, that makes sense. So I started writing plays. So I didn't come out of college thinking I was gonna be a director. I only came out of college thinking I was gonna be a writer. And then I actually, uh, you know, I directed Joe Wagg and it did really well. And I only directed it because the artistic director wanted the publicity of me, of a, of a theater critic doing it. And it did well enough so I had a backer to open up my own theater and I'd done like two shows, you know. I had no idea, but I was actually 22, 23, and I thought, well, what the heck, you know what I mean? Who cares if you go bankrupt? Who cares if you run this thing in the ground? I'm 22 years old. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. I don't, I don't own anything. Yeah. I have no money, I don't own anything. I can, I can, you know, walk away from it. But you started off as a storyteller because you were interested in writing. Yeah. What drove you to story, what's there about storytelling that, that you have a passion about? Well, if you, ask, if you ask why I'm a writer, is that you're asking? Or a storyteller. I, I, think, I think that's what the common thread here is. I'm not sure what... I'll tell you why I'm a writer. I'm a writer because my imagination has never matured. <laughs> when you were a kid, you used to play games, right? You'd play, like, you know, cops and robbers or whatever, right? And you'd imagine this stuff. And I always think that actors are the same. You know, it's like some, you know, the rest of the people put those in boxes and put them in their closet. You know, me, I used to take my baseball cards because I'm a big baseball card collector. And Jack Kralik, uh, the, fifth, the fifth pitcher for the Indians in my little world, won the Cy Young every year because I was creating completely fictitious scenes. And I think that that is the mind of a writer, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you sit with Tom for, you, you, I come out of this, this episode and I start driving home and I think, you know, Tom said something really interesting, and by tomorrow I'm thinking, this is the play that I'm going to write that Tom <laughs> gave me. And it's got nothing to do with really reality, but it has to do with something that you kind of pricked in my mind. Well, now I met you through uh, Storm Morning Theater Company uh, in Kennebunk, Bunk, and you're thinking of moving that eventually to the Portland area. Yeah, we're you're talking about it. You're very involved in the Portland area. How do you see the Portland theater scene, the Portland arts scene, and why are you doing the show f to focus on that? That is an interesting question, which I think Tom knows the answer to. <laughs> um, I, I've been in Maine for five years, and I've come from New York, Boston, Montreal, and Ottawa. That's where, I, where I've been living for, the, for all my adult life. And I found that when I first came to Maine, it didn't feel like there is a cohesiveness in this community. And I'm beginning to feel more and more of that now. But, you know, I, I didn't, I, I'm actually looking forward to having Michael Tour of Crowbait on because Michael Tour is the glue in this town. He brings everybody together once a month. Um, and I wanted to do this show twofold. I wanted to um, make the theater community or expose the theater community to more of an inclusive environment. And I don't think that enough people, and I don't know if they're going to be watching this or not, but I don't think enough people go to theater here. So if this catches you know, their imagination and it makes them want to see a show that Tom's in or that Anita's doing at, at, um, at the Portland stage or go here, uh, these are our first three guests, or go, or go here Lynn Cullen do her storytelling at Bolfini's. If somebody does, goes to one of those that wasn't gonna go before, then that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking to promote that. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point that you said how cohesive or uh, the theater company is, because I, I moved to this area five years ago, even though I've been working in Portland for over 20 years, 
And I wasn't really involved in the theater scene here. I was involved in the theater scene up in the coast in Damariscotta and Newcastle. And so it's taken me a little while to kind of discover the theater scene here. But Crowbait was one of the first things that I discovered, which was lots of fun. It was very much like a, just an evening of entertainment. When they were, when I went, they were doing it at the, um, the that church in the in the East End. East right, End you're talking East about East at uh, uh, in okay, the, yes, what the name of that Mayo Mayo Street Arts Center. Right. That's, that's right. And 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 people were just really loud and vocal in the right. audience and just I missed laughing. that actually. I missed the Mayo for that. Yeah, they're very unruly, which was great because it gave they're that, not real seats, right? Yeah, well, people you, moved around. Yeah, it was, and and there was beer and every, it just felt like a bar where there was theater and you get the script in your hand and you're like nervous because you have to do it in two minutes and you know you you don't know what. It doing. was a party. Well, actually, the part that I got, I don't think I had any lines at all, but it was an, another guy had most of the lines. He was doing a lecture on how different guys scratch their balls, and I had to be the one demonstrating each one, and I couldn't read it fast enough, so I just had to <laughs> listen to him and do it the way I was doing it, and evidently, whenever you scratch your balls, people are going to laugh if you're not on stage, so I learned that it was, it, was, it was fine or whatever. Anything goes, and since then, a friend of mine who's doing camera right now, Robert, has written a couple of things that have been done at Crowbait, and it's just a great kind of um, experimental uh, laboratory for Well, that may not theater. be something that you actually saw going into that, but I'll tell you this about Tom, and, uh, and I mean this. Tom has an, uh, an innate sense of comedy. You do, you know, and, and in my stuff, that can be subtle, and you still know how to bring that subtle comedy through. He did an excellent job playing this Hawaiian beach bum that's 60. <laughs> he was amazing. You know, and I don't even think that Tom really even knew what he was doing. Yeah, but, well, I mean, I think when, when I, I feel good about doing something, I don't know what I'm doing. I just yeah. get lost in well, it. Well, that's perfect. I think most actors do. I think most actors a, lose a themselves. A good actor yeah. won't know what they did. You're yeah. right. Yeah. In it's, fact, often a good actor thinks, oh, I didn't do as good a job this time as I did last time because last time I knew I was doing well, and this time I don't know what I'm doing at all. And I said, that's why you're good this time. Yeah, yeah, right, so, right. Yeah, I think when it's fun, it just feels right. There was a flow, and well, you really you're the can't character, remember. Not yeah. yourself anymore. Yeah, and right. then you you remember back at the part, and you remember, oh, yeah, that's right, it happened. It's like you come from another world, like you're remembering a dream that you're right. in. Right. But I, I, it, but I don't think that crowbait's the only thing. It's one of the things because you could be anybody and walk in there and have your script done or be an actor in it. But also, like, I found what was amazing is that, and I don't think it was the first time that happened, I th that, that uh, Portland Stage with uh, the that, Main Theater Collective did these auditions for all these different theater companies back in December. That's what I'm saying, though. That, it's, that was it's fantastic. Grown. It's grown so much. In fact, you will see in episode two that we talk about mm -hmm. that. It's absolutely right. In fact, Portland Stage has really taken, you know, the mantle of being uh, the, the kind of the conduit for this in a way that... Five years ago, you weren't seen as clearly as you are now. Yeah, there's there, and there's. I, I think there's lots and lots of opportunities. The Main Theater Collective is another one because you just join its website, right. and then I get these emails. Uh, it's a Facebook page, but I don't and go on Facebook well. a lot. I just it just I just get an email every time there's any kind of notice, and so I found out about these audition notices. And even with that that thing that was done in December, since then I've been offered at least seven different parts, and I've been able to take I've like seen three them twice or four of them. Then. So, but but it's it's amazing because. Because in another place, you go in and you tr you go to a new place and you have to audition for this one. You have to audition for that one. You hope people notice you, you know. But the, here, everybody's kind of knows, quickly gets to know each other. I can tell other. you this. I know that in that uh, in that audition that you talked about, I believe that only two of our actors, you and Carolyn, were at that audition. Oh. I don't believe anybody else from our company was. They're company actors. I could be wrong. Um, but I know that both of you have gotten multiple roles since then. Yeah, you know, and that's and a big help. Yeah, it's a huge thing. You know, part of it is because people like me, and I, I think that uh, Anita told me that I think there were 30 different artistic directors there. Mm -hmm. People like me don't know everybody, you know, because there isn't, uh, you know, when you call up an audition in town, often you'll get 15 people. But when you went to this, you got to see 100 people. You know, so you'll see so many people that you didn't even know were here, and you end up, you know, casting them. I, I, I just think that the, just from my little observation and being involved in the last five years, and really not that involved except in the last three maybe, that there's a really vibrant theater community here all of a sudden. Do you get the feeling that it's always been that way? It's, Is that something new? I, I'll tell you this. I feel very much um, like it has grown and connected 
-hmm. in a way that five years ago I didn't, and it could be that I was new, but that I didn't feel, you know? And I've been new to a lot of towns. I was new in Ottawa 20 years ago, and I was new to Montreal in 96, you know? And I was new to New York in 80. But, uh, but here it didn't feel like, you know, totally connected. Oh, now, really? And now it does. Now it has a feeling. I feel like, you know, like we'll share actors and we'll share, the, we'll share audiences. And, and, and the, the amount of plays that are being done. I'm not, I don't have a perception, but it seems there's a lot of theater right. going on. And, and even five years ago, a lot of that theater was Shakespeare. Oh. Now a lot of that theater is newer work or uh, original main stuff. A lot of stuff that... You weren't seeing a lot of five yeah, years ago. And, and that's another thing that you're making me think of. Snow Lion Theater does these play laps where the, I think you just, I was recently, in one. You just <laughs> recently had one. One of my plays, time. Dave's right. last name. That's a, great, that's a great thing to have a, a, a theater company Absolutely. work on your piece, to do a reading, but to hear it. And how, what was that like? I mean, how useful was that for you? It's always useful to have your play read and to hear feedback. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I've actually worked with some well-known playwrights, and one of the things that they all say in unison is a play is never finished, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that a good playwright will absorb that, <laughs> you know? Just because you wrote a play 10 years ago, and when you were talking about the fact that your pieces were so old, you know, the stuff that you did in college, I don't know if that was on this or... or that the, wasn't our okay. pre -recorded. But we were talking, <laughs> sorry, but we were talking about the fact that Tom made these films in... in Col Columbia. In, in Columbia. And, uh, and if they had been stage work, and he says, well, they are so old, who would, you know, who cares about them now? Well, I would myself, and I think if they were a play, you'd be tweaking them till the till the day well, you die. Yeah, yeah right. You know, That's and I love that. I mean, I tweak my plays. You know, it's the same thing with acting, really. I mean, when you when you have a part, it just keeps on growing and growing and growing. And one of the the sad things I think about you know, community theaters, usually it's two weekends and then that's it, maybe three if you're lucky. And just as you're getting into the second weekend, you're hitting your stride, you're finding things in it, you're, you're connecting with the audience and learning things from what they're, how, how they're responding, and then it's over. And, and, and I'm sure that's not, in fact, what the theaters want. It's, it's what the audience right now, and part of the reason I'm actually doing this is I'm hoping that this will be enough of an interest to you, and I mean, I'll do anything. I'll, you know, I'll drop my pants if you're going to sit and watch this, okay? Because I want you to see this, and I want you to end up coming out to theater, because if you come out to theater, we'll do three weeks. We'll do four weeks, you know? We'll yeah. do what the audience will bear. In fact, our theater just went to three weeks, you know? So we're doing three weeks, you know, three shows a week for three weeks, which still is not enough, but it's a start. Yeah, I mean, I think that sometimes in professional theaters, they'll at least in New York, don't they take it out out outside of town before they have their grand opening? Well, Broadway and some off Broadway does that. It's, yeah, it's, they do it, a tour and this, and they're changing the script. Right, and they're working on it all the time. It, yeah. it, it seems like there's a, there's always always something to do in theater. What, what you just said about a play versus a novel, I've never thought about that before. That that there's a, there's a, always a, a chance to get it performed, right. and and in in uh, in a book, you know, it's it's people people don't bother to read actually. A yeah, lot if of you get do. it published, yeah, if, if you get it. it published, and right. when you do a film, it's set in stone. You right. you don't go back to it. But it was it was the most significant single thing any teacher at Tufts ever told me, and it's why I ended up going into theater as well. Yeah, because I wanted to be a writer. And if, if, if being a writer of plays, I don't give a darn if it's I'm writing plays or, or short stories or novels or poetry. I want, I mean, if you're a writer, you want people to hear what you have to say. Yeah. And theater get, does that for and, you. And, and the ability to have it done right away is, is just, at, at least here, a friend of mine, Robert, again, he's standing there. He's texting right now. But he should be on stage doing the with camera. Us. But he and I wrote this play that, that was, a, we, we decided to do it as an improv play with, you know, outlining it. And, and we wanted to see what it would be like to have an improv troupe do it. And yeah. right here in, in, in Media Center, we have playback theater performing every... Uh, you did Exchange Street. You filmed Exchange Street here. We did that. Here, right. uh, but this this the, the playback theater is an improv company right. that performs here twice a month, and many of them came forward and volunteered to do our play as an improv piece here. We videotaped it, got to watch it. And now we're going to meet again and 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 you know uh, play with it and change it a little, maybe write actual it's a dialogue great for it. But it's it's great. I mean, it's actually uh, something I never thought I would do. It's almost like Never Never Land because you have this this talent, a very concentrated group of people that are talented that are willing to work with each other and experiment and. Uh, 
uh, that's that kind of freedom really promotes creativity. If you don't it's have true. that freedom, it's yeah. absolutely true. And being an artist is different than not being an artist in one specific way. I think if you're a banker, if you're a real estate person, if you're um, uh, you know working the stock exchange. Every year you wish to progress, you wish to go up a ladder. There's no such thing as a ladder as a creator. You're always creating something. Last year's project may actually be the, the, the epitome of your art, not next year. It's not like every piece you do is gonna be better than the piece you did before. So it's not like a ladder you're crossing. I ex explain it as, it's like stones in a pond. You know, you're walking from one stone to another, and sometimes you slip and, walk and fill in the pond. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> and other times, you find that it is the most exhilarating stone you could be on, but you still go to the next stone. Right. It's not, you're not looking for every show to be better than the show before. You're looking for every show to be creative, and you're looking to take chances, and sometimes those chances work, and sometimes they don't. But that's what makes you an artist. And, and what you learn from each stone and every way you, it's a different story, it's a different message, and right. you get to experience it in a different way. So you're always learning something. The way that you described that one play that you did about the, the handicapped child, uh, this point of light in the canvas that goes through, that sounds, that seems like the, almost the perfect uh, description of a perfect play. It is. Because it's, it's, it, it, that's what you're looking for, is that one shred of light that you know, hits you and then illuminates things for you as you've never seen them before. And Peter Nichols wrote this in the wake of his own child dying. Mm. And uh, you have to look at that and think, it's why it's virtually perfect. Right. You should read that play. And I'm a film critic too, and I'll tell you this, perfection is rare. I think there's only been one perfect film ever made, and it has one word said in it, and it's the red balloon. Oh, yes. You know, I look at the red balloon, and it's just every frame is perfect. Anyway, I guess that's all we have time for. You know, Tom is, is going to be behind scenes from now on, probably. <laughs> although I may drag him on sometimes. Tom is a great pal and a great interview. Okay? And when somebody doesn't show up in the future, I'm going to bring him up again. He's going to talk about his time at the Muskie Center. <laughs> okay, and, and thank you very much. And tune in next week for Anita Stewart from the Portland Stage Company. Thanks and... See you next week.